Do you wonder if others are dealing with the same project management challenges as you? Not sure where to turn for guidance and leadership? Office hours are in session as we discuss project management and PMOs with global leaders, hearing their story and learning their secrets to success. Our goal is to empower you and help you elevate your PMO and project management career to new heights. Welcome back to Project Management Office Hours with your host, PMO Joe. Welcome, everyone, to Project Management Office Hours. We're the number one live project management radio show in the United States, broadcasting to you from the Phoenix Business Radio X studios in Tempe, Arizona. I'm your host, PMO Joe, and for the next hour or so, we're going to be talking project management with our special guest today. Before we jump into the show itself, I just want to make a couple of announcements, as I always do, to get our shows going. Uh, The first one, uh, the PMO Squad received some great recognition this week as we were named one of the finalists for by the Phoenix Business Journal for Small Business of the Year in the micro category here in Phoenix. And it's always great to get a team recognition for our company like that. Uh, So I certainly want to recognize our team members, our core four of Kaylee, Derek, Jerome, and myself, of course, uh, and then all of our consultants that are serving our clients in the field. They're really the ones that make the biggest impact uh, because they are out there touching our customers. So thank you to everybody within the squad. And in September, we find out who the winner is. Hopefully it'll be us. Uh, if not, still very honored to make it to the finals and be recognized for that. Uh, following along the awards theme, last show, I had mentioned that I had made it to the semifinalist position for PMO Influencer of the Year by the PMO Global Alliance. And on Monday, earlier this week, they announced the finalist, and I'm in the final four. Uh, So it's down to me, uh, Leonardo Torres, uh, Lindsay Scott, and Dr. Saadi uh, out of Lebanon uh, are the final four. So super excited to be recognized in that category. So an individual recognition in the industry and also a company recognition here locally within our business community. So it's fantastic to be recognized for that. Also a reminder uh, for those in our industry that the PMO leader global conference is scheduled to take place on October 18th this year. It is a free registration. Thanks to our sponsors. And we encourage everybody to attend. We're going to be doing something a little bit different this year. We've broken the world up into three regions, right? An APAC region, an EMEA region, and an Americas region. And we're going to go 15 hours consecutive live content starting in Asia, or sorry, in Australia. We'll go for five hours, and then we'll go with five hours of live content out of the EMEA region and five hours of live content out of the Americas region. So frequently, when we attend these global conferences, we get local time, wherever that conference is being held, five or eight hours worth of content. And if those hours are off hours for you, perhaps it's the middle of your night, you don't get to see that content live. So we're going to try to solve that for everybody. Regardless where you're located, we should have live content for you that can fit into your time zone. So October 18th, uh, please go out and register on the site that's listed there. And we'll be excited to share with you all the great speakers and presenters that we're having. Also want to remind everybody that these shows are worth one PDU to you, right? We last and we go an hour long. And if you're looking for continuous education and your PDU credits, <clears throat> go back and listen to all the shows. And you've got a hundred after today, 108 hours worth of shows. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, Be sure to take some time, go back and listen to all of our previous guests. It's not just about the PDU. It's certainly about all the information that our fantastic guests have shared over the years. Uh, Also want to remind everybody we are live, right? This is being live streamed right now on Internet Radio, YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook. uh, And of course, we'll record as well. So if you miss it live, we'll have it out on your favorite podcast platform in about a week. Uh, But if you are listening live today, just drop a note in the comment section. Let us know where you're joining from. 
it's always fun to be able to see where we have guests coming from around the world who are joining in with us. And that's it for the announcement. Super excited today to have with us our special guest joining us from the UK, Ruth Bedingfield. Welcome, Ruth. Hi, Joe. Thank you very much for having me. Excited to be here. Yes, it's fantastic uh, to have someone joining us from across the pond, as they say. Um, so your accent will uh, stand out <laughs> to everyone. Uh, if you can take a moment, just share a little bit about yourself, let the audience know who you are, and, and then we'll jump into some fun conversation. Absolutely, sure. So hi, everyone. I'm Ruth Bedingfield. Um, as you can tell, as Joe said, I'm from England, currently um, in Salisbury, so sort of south central um, of England, for those of you that know. Um, my husband is military, so home is where we are for now. Uh, so that could change. My experience, I guess, 15 years sort of in the um, 15 years career sort of in in a different administration, um, five plus years within PMO leadership and management um, and recently started my journey on the other side of PMO, supporting my fellow my fellow PMOers um, from um, from a product side, from a customer success side as well. It's fantastic. <laughs> you know, and that's what we're going to dig into, right? A lot to be able to understand um, that journey you've been on. Uh, Absolutely. So let's let's go back to time as a PMO leader, right? So you know, this is project management office hours. Obviously, we we talk project management stuff. So let's get you grounded into why people need to listen to what you're sharing. And you were a leader of a PMO for a really large organization. Uh, global and and had some good experience there correct absolutely so um i was didn't just go in as pmo manager i joined our pmo um for office depot or depot as i yeah. uh, as i hear regularly now now viking direct um yeah as a pmo officer um and i think it was that it was that opportunity that really clicked with me i i found something that really um meshed well with my own core values so PMO to me is helping people you know unlock and achieve things that they that they can't do by themselves uh you know whether that's project success or you know um governance obstacles you know if we put it in PMO terms but it was that it was that real click that I can help people achieve more um so yeah I was PMO officer um and then was really fortunate to get the opportunity to then take over and manage that team and really progress the progress the PMO to to where they are and where they continue to to go and develop as as I'm sure you you know that PMOs are forever adapting and forever changing with the the change that we all live with and work with so yeah that that was the 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 basis there and, and what was the you know when you the time before you managed the whole PMO and then obviously you're managing the PMO I'm imagining some good lessons learned in that journey right as a contributor then as a leader what, was, what were some of those for you yeah absolutely so I think I always liken PMO to to being on the ocean sometimes the, it's forever changing the, the ground is never stable sometimes the waves are small and it's like a mill pond sometimes it's like a storm and the the waves are are crashing down around you but as a PMO you you learn and you adapt to ride those waves um I think agility and um adaptability uh sorry were really key for me to be able to grow in in the role of of the PMO officer when I first joined there was very little consistency, very little transparency. We were very siloed in the way that we supported, even from a governance framework perspective, different functions had different ways of governing, which is not necessarily bad, but when they're combative against each other, it makes for a really tricky um, tricky work life. And we, we were really seen as the project police. We weren't that support or the advisory role that we really truly should be. Um, there wasn't any clarity even from within the department or our leaders as to what our, what our strategy was, what the roadmap was. Um, so it was a real eye opener to, to see how um, that can be 
really create a combative sort of atmosphere to work in and people would just do everything to avoid us Mm. so I took it upon myself and it was my mission at that point to start talking to people and to get them to and to listen for me to understand and then feedback um why what their their concerns were why they were avoiding us you know what did they want from their PMO what did they see as what PMO could do for them um so it was a real from that grounding it that I've never forgotten that lesson that you've got two ears and one mouth for that reason you know double listening one talking and it was really that that um allowed me to understand what my customers wanted from from me and how I could help them achieve what they wanted to get to and help others understand as well what PMO can bring. Yeah, we hear that so often, the project police, right? That the yeah. PMO is non-value add. They're just trying to make sure we follow a process. They don't understand the business. And the reality is of a, a high functioning PMO, that couldn't be further from the truth, right? The, it's the opposite. We're we're a service organization supporting the organization achieve their objectives through project execution. So how do you, how did you, I'm sure it's not a, a simple story, right? It's, oh, we flipped the switch and it worked. Yeah. Where, what, was, what was that journey like to be able to try to turn that around? So it was, it was a really interesting journey. Um, when I was able to sort of get hold of the reins, I was really fortunate to also be, um, have the support of some really strong, open-minded leaders and, and sponsors as well of PMO that really felt the value. I think that was one key um, benefit that I certainly, you know, benefited from within our organisation. But we did a full reset. I said to everybody, just stop. It's not working. We're, we're firefighting, for instance. We're, we're chasing tails. We're not proactively listening. We need to stop. So we so that's exactly what we did. And we went back to basics. And when I say basics, I think we had four core things that we followed. We followed what's the strategy, not just from an organization perspective, but what's the PMO strategy? Have we ever had one? And we identified that we didn't. Mm. Then we sat down as a team and we discussed where we felt we were as a PMO and where we wanted to be. So then we built our own roadmap. And we created simple steps to say, well, if we are, if our goal is over here to the left in time, then how are we going to get there? And we made made sure that the steps that we put in place were achievable. We didn't want to boil the ocean. We knew that we had to do this gradually. And also we had to take our key stakeholders and our audience along with us. So we had to do it carefully. Um, and the framework we realized that we had in place was not fit for purpose we didn't understand what the leadership wanted. And ultimately it was really simple. They just wanted to know progress, cost, benefit, and scope. So those key four things, they weren't bothered how they received the information. They weren't bothered what the information was in the sense as show me good and show me bad, don't hide things, mm-hmm. which was really key as well. They, they were really, um, frank to say we want to see everything so that that's what we worked on we we had to find a way to be able to be transparent to make sure that we listened and how and understood how we needed to progress as a PMO into that advisory role so people came to us with openness and transparency so that we could help them and they understood that we were there to support them achieve more you know, and I think that's so important for, for our listeners to, to pick up on, right, is you didn't try to force on the organization what the PMO should be. You helped shape the PMO for what the organization was saying it needed it to be, right? Is, it, is, is that correct? Am I following? No, that's, that's exactly right, Joe. And I have to say, we transformed our strategy probably three times because we had to to align with the organization because the organization changed and what worked for a certain period of time wouldn't have worked for the future. And I think it's that adaptability within, um, within PMO and the, the attitudes within PMO that really then drive the organization to see, well, actually 
they are value add. They they do want to support us in what we want to achieve, but they're helping us do so with, you know, with structure. Yeah, and I think the it takes a certain kind of leader to be able to guide that sort of transformation and having the openness to, to not try to stand above it all and say, well, I'm in charge of this. We're going to do it my way. Right. I mean, you have to be able to, to be able to read the room and to be able to understand the organization's needs and what they're telling you. So where does that come from? Right. Because not everybody's built that way. You, you had the courage and the capability to be able to do that. And so who, how does Ruth have that in her? Where does that come from? <laughs> um, so again, I think it, it's part of my own core values. I, I am driven and I have such a thrill from helping people and seeing people achieve what they want to achieve, knowing that I've been part of that, that it, it part of it is quite natural to me, but also so, some of it is learned from when, from being a PMO officer, from also acknowledging that you have to, um, you're dealing with multiple stakeholders all the time, whether they are your team, whether they are project managers, whether they're you know, resource managers, whether they're C-suite, you, you have to be adaptable. And again, always two ears, one mouth. It's the listening factor and really actively listening as opposed to just hearing. Um, there, yeah. Um, I think as well, it was really articulating in, an, in a very simple, clear way that I'm there to understand and guide as, as an SME, because that's my job, you know, I, I, I'm the PMO, not them. So let me help you with my knowledge and my expertise rather than dictate and obstruct, you know, let me, let me support you. Let me give you some parameters. I used, I used an analogy um, with our project managers and it was, it was like a bowling alley. And I said, PMO and our framework will be your bumpers. You can bowl your ball and I will ensure you will not fall down that gully where your ball will end up will be down to you. Mm. So, do you know, it was it was that sort of um, partnership, I guess, with them to to see that I, you know, I will I will be there and I will tell them if things are wrong. I will report transparently. So, if you're also not telling me honestly, you'll be caught. But but I'm here to help and listen. And and we 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 were that sort of a team. And I was really lucky that. I had team a, a team behind me that backed that principle. So you, I think you said about five years or so you were in the PMO. Yes. yes. How? What was the progression of that journey over time? Did that take six months, a year? I mean, no. how quickly or slowly <laughs> did all of that move? Um, so I I was fortunate to get the opportunity to start leading the team quite early on in that journey. So I had a good year of solid PMO officer experience thrown in in the deep end all the challenges and then sort of year probably maybe five six years in PMO but yeah four, four and a half five years as the manager um, and again it was the first year was all about the the gentle framework let's guide and let's start allowing our organization to see that we can deliver success we can support that delivery of success and then and then grow from there one of the key pivots for me as well within that um and I, I'm going to plug keyed in but it was getting a PPM tool mm -hmm. and it could have been anyone but from vent you know we went through the vendor selection and, and and everything but having one source of the truth where everything was pumped in and everything was drawn from all the outcomes came from one place people then started to see the the consistency the transparency um and they really had confidence in what they were receiving from an outputs perspective. Um, but that that journey there took a good three years to get to that confidence level where we were seen as a value add um, organize, you know, a department within the organization, sorry, um, that we weren't challenged on our data, but we were we were used from an analysis perspective by the leadership team. That took a good good three years of hard graft <laughs> yeah, yeah for sure so common we hear today as we go out pmo squad goes out and works with clients right to help them with their pmos and 
and we always get, can you get this done in the next six months? Right. And what you've shared is what we, we try to share as well as maturity takes time, right? You can't just wish to be mature. It, it's an evolution. What's the kind of the message that you would have for PMO leaders out there today about this sort of transformation they would have to go on to help them share with their organization and set expectations for what to expect as you transform into this new service-based PMO? I think the, the underlying tone of all messages has to always have in mind your audience and they want to know what's in it for them. So as long as you can articulate your goals in a way that translates into what they know that they're going to get from you, that always helps take them on the journey with you. Um, for us, it was consistency and transparency. Um, we, we had a roadmap. We created that as a team and we checked ourselves with our leadership to make sure that we were continually aligned with the organization strategy um, within within the sort of the lifetime of um, my PMO management, we went through three transformations and the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So business strategy changed multiple times within that. We were divested from a US, from the global site to European only, and we had to, to switch and pivot there. Um, and the roadmap changed each time. And I think the, the reason that we remained strong and still had that um, the growth and the maturity within the PMO to be that value add function was because we were consistent and we didn't shy away from continually sharing what's next and also we shared what's failed I think that was a real key because we were so I was really transparent I protected you know I protected the team as such and it was me being the face of PMO as their leader you know I'm not going to ask them to do something I'm not willing to do myself mm -hmm. so you know we we went on that journey with our key stakeholders, with multiple different leadership, um, but we were consistent and we were transparent. The good, the bad, and the ugly. That's, that's so important <laughs> for everyone to know, right? Is you can't build trust in your organization if you're not transparent. Right? Yeah. And, and yeah. as much as you don't want to ever fail, we do. We're humans, right? We're fallible, and we have to be able to own those and learn from them yeah. To be able to get the organization to trust us to know that, hey, it's going to be okay. We, we've got a good leader in charge there. Now, through this story, thank you for sharing all of that. <laughs> I think that's so important to set the stage of the next part of your journey, right? As you, you had mentioned, keyed in uh, had become your tool of choice. Um, and something started to happen with you using that tool and your your working with that company right and ultimately you're now with keyed in right so give us, give us <laughs> the second stage of the story right you <laughs> yeah. you help this pmo on a transformation then you go through a transformation right Personally, indeed go to enough organization so share that with us yeah of course so ultimately even from first engagement with with keyed in i i felt instantly co comfortable um they very much like me they were very open they were very open about what they can do but also what they can't do and you know I really appreciated that we were going through vendor selection we were giving we were getting so much information thrown at us but this one this one really felt like it wasn't the hard sell so I instantly had a a bit more of a connection with um the people that we were dealing with um then as we as we embedded the tool um you know we had the, the continual support from Keedin, but with the encouragement to be very self-served on that, um, you know, stand on your own two feet, but we're here to catch you if you fall. Very much that attitude. And ultimately, it was the way that Keedin made me feel as a customer. And I wanted to be part of that. I wanted to be part of that organization that cared so deeply for their customers that they're willing to go over and above and also make other customers feel like that. And I think that was the, the driving part. We're so customer centric here at Keyed In. We're, like I said, we're honest and we're open and everything is inclusive, even internally, but also with our customers. Nothing's off the table. There's no taboo question or anything like that. Um, I can. Re I feel really myself, um, having jumped over the other side of the fence, should we say? And 
to be completely transparent with you, Joe, my core values were being really rocked by another transformation in Viking. And I had to really take stock and understand that the future of the organization in, in Viking wasn't going in the same way that my values were going. And it was a really difficult decision, leaving the people. It, your head always, you know, there's always that head and heart battle, isn't there? Mm-hmm. Um, but to be to be true to myself and to be authentic, I had to I had to make that decision that I can either stick with my team or trust that I've given them the best footing to continue to be successful and follow what's in my heart and where I need to go as an individual. And I think he didn't just fit perfectly at that moment. I always believe things happen for a reason. I'm very much, um, you know, a, a believer of you are where you're exactly meant to be. And I think that's that's where that's why I'm here. <laughs> well, and I think you did something that not a lot of people do, right? You have to have courage so that when opportunity knocks, you're willing to answer the door. And a lot of people hear opportunity knocking and they move away from the door because the status quo is just easier. Yeah. And what I, we try to talk about this a lot on the show is that as project leaders and PMO leaders, we have to be the ones willing to run into the fire, right? We have to have that sort of courage baked into us because this job just demands that we be that type of person. And when we bring on guests that have answered the call and done that, I hope it's a validation to everybody out there that you can have success after you answer the opportunity knock, right? And you're just another example in this long list of guests we've had that have taken that chance. And and now you found more joy and more success afterwards. I'd also say that that's the opportunity knocks within PMO as well. So, you know, like you, you talk there about the status quo, that is so true. You get so stuck in, well, we've always done it this way. And that was one of the pivotal moments within our PMO when we all came together and we we said, this is really stagnant. This isn't this isn't working. And we were talking about our governance framework. We, we had already started identifying that there needed to be flex. And the reason for that is we were, as an organization, looking at the agile methodologies and incorporating more of that sort of um, a delivery method within, within change. Um, and there was, there was toing and froing between us. And ultimately, we went as a team to our core leadership team and we gave them some options. And the challenge was, but we haven't ever done it like that. And I said, well, why not try? Mm-hmm. Why, why should we not try? We have an opportunity as we incorporate new ways of working, new ways of delivery. Let's mix it up. If it doesn't work, we know we've got a method that does. We'll try something new. So that that opportunity knocks is a is a really good point within the PMO world as well. All right, so we opportunity knocks and keyed in is on the other side of the door. But what how, how does that transition happen? Right, I mean, is how do you determine which role you're going to take with them? <laughs> they, they are the dark side, right? It's the software vendor. They can't be someone that's going to help us. But but you had worked with them already, so built some relationships. Tell us how you get into the role where you're at today and and how you're able to help continue that service that you received as a customer onward to other customers as well. So I'm, I'm a customer success manager, which sings to my heart um, here at Keedin. Um, And I hope that I, I do provide a rounded level of support for our customers. I always ensure that I am empath- empathetic with our customers when they come to me with either challenges or questions. And I think that because I can draw on real life experience and put myself in their shoes, that it really helps them understand that I get it. I I can almost, month end, if I have to, if I speak with a customer towards month end, I can sense and I feel their urgency to end the call because it's reporting. Or, you know, if a report hasn't quite um, drawn out the data that they need, I can sense that, um angst to make it work and to make it right but also I can see the joy when they get there and I love that that is just 
it's it's incredible to be able to be part of that as well. Um, and I think as a as a team, we're almost like a multifaceted gem. I I bring that customer experience. Um, and product knowledge from a customer perspective. So I'm not vendor. Um, I know the product as a user um, and I can take that back to our product team and I can say, hey, this is brilliant functionality, but we need it to tweak because it doesn't quite work in real life. Mm-hmm. Um, or a customer has advised um, a different way of doing something. And I think that could really work because of, and it's just that additional voice that supports the customer. and. And Keedin really is shaped by by our customers and what they need. Um, so it's 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 unlike any other vendor that I've ever experienced before in my in my PMO career. One of the things I'll I'll mention just because I've worked with Keedin as well, just to be transparent with everybody, right? So <laughs> it's not necessarily a Keedin commercial, but but they do some things really really well, and they have out on their website now a series called the Keyed In Mastering Series, where they've invited myself, Laura Bernard, Andy Jordan, and Mike Hannan, uh, Hannan, to come on and talk about topics like resource planning and portfolio management and prioritization as a service to customers coming out to a software site. You can then get some industry expertise to give you some best practice on how to help in those business functions. So yes, of course, they want you to buy their software, but they know that their service to their customer base goes beyond just a software product, right? It's how can we help you be successful? They know it's a full suite of services, not just one. And that's what I like about what Keydin does. And it's kind of what you're sharing as well. When you were a customer, you felt that, right? And you wanted to be a part of it. So certainly encourage everybody to learn more about Keydin um, and this mastering series um, but also just learn more about how you're you're sharing your experiences as well so with that mindset what is kind of that evolution right so you're a as you mentioned you're a customer success leader now can you i don't know if you can give examples or or if you can maybe without names but give us an example of what that means right what does that job mean if i'm the customer and, and you're on the other end of the line because I'm frustrated because you're just a software yeah. vendor. How do you really help them understand that you're more than that? Again, two ears, one mouth. Mm-hmm. So always listening. And it's really important for me to be able to articulate to our customers that this is definitely a partnership. Um, I'm successful when they're successful. And I'm, I'm there not to drive sales or... Um, you know, increased revenue or anything like that. I'm there to make sure that they are getting the maximum value that is right for them, not right for me, but right for them. So roadmaps is really key. I think understanding what's next for my customer. So whether that's, you know, immediate next steps, whether it's three, six, 12, 18 months down the line, and then allowing, allowing them to know that as a keyed in expert now or or as customer success leader, I can advise them and of how we can support them achieve those goals. But we're also really transparent to say that's really good. That's business or actually that's that's a brilliant next objective. Um, You need to continue what you're doing to make sure you've got that stability and maturity within, you know, the data, for instance. So it's it's now having that for forward looking or future view with our customers and really getting to know them in the way that I felt that I was known as a customer. And you mentioned earlier when you were doing your introduction, your husband is in the military service <laughs> and you travel around a bit. So in this post COVID world, or I guess we're still during COVID world, I guess this is the new world order. Um, when we got to first meet each other, I think you were in your childhood bedroom <laughs> as we were chatting, right? So, Absolutely. So life within Keaton, I think, allows you to, to be a good wife as well and, and support your family as your husband's assignments travel. Is that true? Absolutely. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, people talk about um, work home life balance. But for me, balance sort of indicates that something could be out of kilter. So for me, blend is better. Um, sometimes... Um, I, I need to give more to 
to work and to customers. And I have the support of my family behind me that understand that. But then Keedon is very, very understanding in the fact that sometimes that blend has to shift slightly. And family, you know, family is first always in Keedon's eye. So there is a great blend here. Um, at Keedin, I feel 100% supported. And as I said, even internally, nothing is off the table. Everything is open for discussion. Um, and I don't feel previously in with previous employers, I think I would have been slightly hesitant maybe to raise some topics that I've already raised at Keedin um, because of, I don't know, corporate attitudes let's say yeah. but here it doesn't I don't feel as if that I feel as if I'm talking to an extended family yeah and that that comfort probably allows you then to be able to serve customers better right because you are not on edge you're not concerned no. with what you're going to do right you've got the support of your company to support you so really a uh, smart move by Keaton and the other companies that are doing that sort of support for their employees because really it's customer service that they're providing because they're making sure their employees have what they need to be successful. Absolutely. And as I said, nothing nothing is off the table. And even today, I'm I'm asking questions around the group for expertise in, in specific areas that maybe I I know that is a potential gap for me or where I need to expand my knowledge slightly and everybody comes in and you know offers that support or the guidance and help so you're never left floating should I say it's you know there's a real sense of community within the organization and I think that really does um is is passed down to our customers because that's you know that's ultimately what we want to to achieve that partnership feel and they're they're an extended part of us almost Mm-hmm. Now, obviously critical to be able to have that cultural fit that you've already shared with us, but also the tool has to work, right? I mean, if you yeah. were <laughs> if you were at Office Depot and, and you're like, man, this thing just is a piece of junk. I can't work at it. You're never going to go leave and, and join them, right? So what is it about the tool that works, right? Again, there's so many choices for PMO leaders out there to pick software to be able to help them or even fall back on the standards like Microsoft Project and yeah. Excel and, and and Word and those. So why Keydin, right? What about it made you comfortable enough to to look for the culture because there was success with the tool? I th I think just just to underpin all this, the the tool can only be as good as the data you put in. And we've been through iterations of really poor data and it does create misguided frustration um, where people think it's actually the tool. And if you take a step back, it's actually, you know, it's it's poor data creating poor outcomes. However, with keyed in, it's such a rounded, a rounded uh, product. It really can be the central source of truth. Um, it can be. It can be for timesheet tracking. So you're getting your budgets. Uh, project managers have everything they need to be fully equipped. We had non-project managers managing projects. And because Keedin is so um, adaptable and intuitive, they were able to follow you know, really simple steps, really simple guidelines and manage a project through to success or sometimes failure, but they had everything they needed in one place without formal project management training. I think that was a real um, tell for me that this product is sat, you know, is really solid. Resource management gives really good transparency. And I think once you've got strong data in the resource management area of the product, it really supports those those poor resource managers that are screaming and shouting that they are over capacity, they're over demanded, they have too much work. And you can show without emotion, just using data from one place, that exact fact. And they feel so empowered when they've got that behind them. Um, that that, again, another real win for us in the PMO was to be able to say, we can't do that project. If we do, this is the impact or if you if you need us to make this change, then we need to have this many more people. So it really did empower strategic decision making rather than, you know, he who shouts loudest wins sort of conversations. And it so that's sort of the basis. But then roll up to portfolio management. You can do genuine portfolio management. Um, and I know from colleagues as a PMO manager, from stakeholders as a PMO manager, from 
colleagues in other um, areas using other tools pro portfolio management means different things to different people mm -hmm. but if we take it in its core um, what keyed in allows you to do is not just the bottom-up planning and group projects under programs under portfolios but also the top down so you can look at that key strategic layer have key strategic deliverables and roll it down cascade that to see what it looks like within one place you can then also within the tool, which I found really useful during the pandemic, I have to say, is scenario plan. So taking the data that you've already got in, in the system, and it can be simple data, just what the change is, what the change is going to cost, is the benefit if that's important to your organization, and who do you need? Taking those four key points, you can pluck the data live up and out the tool and start scenario planning. You can create what if scenarios. Um, and we we did that in Office Depot uh, within, within the pandemic. You know, we had to very quickly pivot um, when we lost a lot of people um, due, to, due to COVID and, you know, really hunkering down to, to make the organization sustainable. Um, and without that scenario planning, being able to with data again that's really important to say okay based on our strategic ranking these are our top projects this is our waterline this is what's out it allowed us to pivot and change the portfolio within a matter of i think we following our approval process it took us probably about eight days in total to get from one portfolio three different what if scenarios to the new version for to, to sustain us through the pandemic so it was a real and I wouldn't have been able to do that without keyed in excel would have taken me weeks to do um, and I think it's that the multifaceted area within the portfolio analysis that really sets it apart for me anyway as a user and and you've been on both sides of the fence right obviously yep. as a user and now as someone who's supporting users what do you think the experience has, how that's helped you being on both sides, right? To be able to know who knows what's next. Obviously there's no desire to leave uh, Keaton or anything like that, but you're going to continue to evolve in your role. And now that maybe you're seeing something on the Keaton side that you didn't see as a customer, it's probably made you more well-rounded uh, in your ability to support. What's kind of the, that key takeaway now that you've been on both sides? So I'm I'm always going back to my customers and checking, did you know, especially as to that point, Joe, I have experienced a lot more, um, like you said, the, the well-rounded, as as we've said, Keydin is quite configurable. So we had in Office Depot, our system configured to what our organisational needs were. There's a lot more out there within the functionality of the tool. So, you know, task planning, for instance, to assignment based um, scheduling. I didn't use that. Now I can really uh, grow in my knowledge there and take that back to my customers and say, hey, did you know if you did that, you can get this? Or even, you know, cool little report tricks that I didn't know as a customer that I know now. I'm immediately, you know, sharing that with customers saying, hey, did you know? We've we've started um, tips and tricks videos that I record and waffle over um, but we share those with customers as well saying don't forget you can do this and you know it's it's things like that it's just relaying that back to to our customers to make sure that they have that roundedness as well within their own knowledge because um, knowledge is not power knowledge is for sharing let's face it you know what am I going to do if I only I know about a really cool report widget it's not going to benefit me necessarily I need to tell my customers so yeah so what do you think, um, again, we're talking about keyed in because that's where you are, but just in general to folks who, who lead PMOs, but they're afraid of the technology, right? Because they, they, it may tell a story that doesn't make their PMO look good, right? And, and it's like, oh, man, I don't know if I want to do this. So they, they don't take full advantage of what the technology offers them. Or what, what does technology provide for a PMO leader? I, th I think... PMOs need to be brave and they need to they need to accept that 
to be a successful PMO, they have to be transparent. And that is reporting both sides of the picture. Um, so, and technology, any, any PPM that allows visibility of data really empowers PMO to, to remove emotion from decision making. Um, that was a, a, a real stepping stone for me as well when I could go back to key leaders, key sponsors, key stakeholders and say, hey, I know you're shouting and screaming to get your change done, but look at the data. You know, it's, it's, it's going to cost X and we'll only get Y, which means that all these other changes are above it. Do you want to take this data away and have a discussion at your peer level and, and offer them back the choice? You know, do you, want, do you still want to fight for this change? But without the technology to be able to collate that information and hold the data true, I wouldn't have been able to do that. So I think for PMO leaders, it, again, it goes back to two ears, one mouth, listen, but be brave with it as well. And, and have confidence. You're, you're the expert within here. The People can talk down to PMO. They can maybe, I had it where the, the CIO of our organization didn't even know what PMO was. So mm. again, education, education, talk to people. Be really open and don't don't pretend you're something you're not as well. I think when we took that step back and we did our reset and we identified what we were currently as a PMO, which wasn't really the value add, it wasn't the advisory or the guidance role, own it. Say, hey, we know that we know we're not there yet, but we want to be more and we need you to support us to be more. And then from a technology perspective, Start simply, don't try and overcomplicate it and just allow it to be your support, allow it to be your crux, but allow it, you, you must have consistency and transparency. Did I answer that question, Joe? Sorry. Yes, absolutely. It, <laughs> it, 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 as you're, you're speaking, I'm thinking of, of other questions because okay. you provide such great perspective that isn't so pro PMO. And I wonder where that's rooted because you only, we only went back in history about five years within <laughs> that PMO career. What helped shaped your mindset prior to that? Because you, you really do approach that with the mindset of it, it's okay for me to, to show that I'm not, you know, doing well and, and that we need to change. And, and that's so hard for so many people to do. So there had to be something along the way they kind of empowered you to know that that would be okay and that you'd be in a safe place even if you did that yeah i think um i think gen generally in my in my life i'm a, quite an honest person anyway and i will i don't see holding my hands up and saying help as a as a weakness um i see that as actually i am acknowledging and I'm quite self-aware that I can't do this alone or I am failing. Please, could someone help me? Um, this is going to sound really silly, but when I was, my very first job, I worked in a dry cleaners and <laughs> I was front of house taking the clothes in and giving the clean clothes out. I stayed there as my Saturday job and I was, one Saturday, I was able to actually go back of shop and start helping with the the cleaning of the clothes and I got the chemicals wrong and I tried mm -hmm. to hide it and I came I just came foul of that mm -hmm. and I think I the way that I felt about being dishonest for hiding it and also the way that the customer felt or I, I saw the customer's reaction because I damaged their clothes and I never wanted to make anyone feel like that again and had I just said is that the right one or am I doing this right? Maybe that could have been avoided. And I think that was a life lesson at 16 to say, if you're genuinely not sure, just ask. Because what's the worst that can happen? Yeah, I, I mean, that's so powerful. And, <laughs> and, and we think with project managers, we, you know, if we do weekly status reports, every week we have the opportunity when necessary to turn a project red. But Absolutely. so many project managers don't because they think it's a reflection of their ability to lead a project. And what, what you're just saying is you're about to ruin their clothes. Tell them, <laughs> yeah. tell them it's red because they can help you. And, exactly. But it's you have such to a know powerful you learn thing. from that, right? Absolutely. It is such a powerful thing to be able to say, I need help here. And it 
it empowers other people to step in. Um, that was one really key thing with our project sponsors as well. Using uh, Keydin's publish to function, I know I keep saying it, but as a customer, um, we, we use the publish to and the escalation path that's built into the system. And we created a really simple dashboard for our, our sponsors. And if something turned red on that dashboard, they were on it. They were on it so quickly and the path to green was met so much faster because it was visible and they knew that they had to then step up. And it was that gentle encouragement to say, ask for help, ask for help. What do you need? What do you need? That our PMs felt more confident in actually saying help um, and knowing that their heads weren't going to get chopped off for it. Yeah. I I love that. that. Because that's that's so important. Uh, for especially young project managers who who may never have had their head chopped off yet, right? Where they're like, oh, no, I'm about to put my project red. I'll make it yellow instead, and then nobody will get mad at me. It isn't about getting mad at the project manager. It's about showing the true status of the project to get the help that you talked about, right? Because an engaged yeah. sponsor is the number one reason for project success. Being red can keep them engaged. I mean, we don't want to be red, right? We we would love it would go well, but projects don't. They just they don't always go well. No, that's the nature of the ocean that we ride, right? Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. So, a, a complete side note for everybody that's listening. Before the show started, I was talking with our producer and and Ruth and others about this. Put in the comments if you don't know who Nirvana <laughs> is. There's, I'm learning there's a generation of people out there who do not know who the band Nirvana is. And I don't I know think... if that makes me feel old or if it makes them feel as if they should know who Nirvana is. So I'm I'm going through a personal turmoil today. Trying we should to put the link we should put the wiki page to Nirvana on Joe. <laughs> add that in. Oh, the world cannot forget Nirvana, please. If you don't know who Nirvana is, go research them and, and make sure that you're aware of who they are. Uh, and, and the Foo Fighters, the, the right, Dave Grohl's band who came afterwards. Not the Food Fighters, but the Foo Fighters. Uh, and we want to make sure that people know them as well. Ruth, this has been awesome. Uh, it's been a great conversation because, um, frankly, I think just your natural ability to communicate uh, helps me feel at ease, right? When you're talking and, and letting me know that, Hey, this person's been there before and done that and I can learn from her. So what would be some maybe last words of encouragement or advice for people who are either starting their career, or maybe starting as a new PMO leader, uh, to be able to help them have some perspective about what they're about to, you know, their journey they're going to go on. I think go steady on yourself. Don't try and boil the ocean. Do things simply. Um, And my father-in-law is um, a plumber, a heating and engineer plumber. And he he always tells me that if you tighten a tap too tight, it will start to leak. So sometimes enough is just enough. So I always keep that in my mind as well when, when approaching things. And certainly as a PMO manager, is what you're doing enough? And if it is, then it's enough. And that's brilliant. Um, two ears, one mouth always works brilliantly. Be a listener, be an active listener, really take on board. And don't be afraid, don't be afraid of flexibility. Things change. We live with change daily. You need to just sometimes take it on the chin that what worked yesterday needs to change today. Um, and it's not a reflection on you. It's actually your your flexibility and agility to be able to change is a real positive reflection um, on PMO. And I'd say just go for it. Listen, listen to what your stakeholders need and see how you can how you can deliver that and help them support uh, and achieve that success. Perfect. I lo- and, I, and I always like the the different use of phrasing and words. Sorry, uh, yes. <laughs> the, the toings and froings you had said earlier and uh, brilliant uh, is, is, a, is kind of the brilliant British version of awesome, I guess. We've awesome, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So Ruth, how can folks, we've got your LinkedIn profile here up yep. on the screen, but how can folks get in touch with you and learn more about what you do and keyed in and, and help Yeah, them? absolutely. As you say, follow, please feel free to connect with me directly on, on keyed in or follow keyed in on LinkedIn um, as well. I think Joe, you've got 
um, some options there for people to to find that as well. But yeah, um, just have a search for Keedin, um, and please feel free to connect with us. Awesome, brilliant. Thank you, uh, Ruth. This has been great, and of course, thank oh, you thank to you, all Joe. of our listeners. I saw you were joining from the states and the UK and around the world. Uh, be sure to visit the PMO Squad website so you can see all of our upcoming guests as well as all 107 previous shows that we've had are all out there on the PMO squad site. We have an incredible lineup of guests joining us for the rest of the year. Dr. Robert Jocelyn will be joining us uh, in our next show. We'll follow that up in September with Milan Dordovich and Mate Severa. Trek Via will be joining with PMI. They'll be discussing the citizen developer program. Chris Sprague and some of his colleagues from the PMO Global Alliance will be joining us to talk about their healthcare initiative. And Sanjay Augustine will be our final show of the year. A reminder, of course, as I said at the beginning, these shows were live, but we do record them. So they're all available on your favorite podcast platform. Be sure to subscribe to Project Management Office Hours on Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Spreaker, whatever your platform of choice may be. And thank you to our sponsors, the PMO Squad and the PMO Leader Global Community. The PMO Squad is one of the premier project management consulting firms in the United States and now a finalist for Phoenix Small Business of the Year. Um, so go out and check that out. And then, as I mentioned at the beginning, the PMO Leader Global Community is having their annual conference on October 18th. That's free for all to register. So I highly encourage you to go out and do that as well. That's it for now. Office hours are closed. Until next time, I'm PMO Joe, and you've been listening to Project Management Office Hours. Thanks for listening to another episode of Project Management Office Hours with PMO Joe. You're not alone in your project management journey. We're here to help you achieve your goals. Subscribe to Project Management Office Hours on your favorite podcast platform to catch all of our episodes and hear industry leaders share their story and secrets to success.